It's good to see all of you out tonight. Tonight I'm going to be returning to a section of scripture that we have been talking about on Sunday evenings, and that is, as we call these, the lessons from the small books. And I'll be talking about the danger of false teachers from 2 Peter, the second chapter. So if you'd like to join me there, that's, that will be our text tonight. And uh, I will read the first 10 verses of that chapter. Uh, 2 Peter 2, beginning in verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false prophets among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For, for if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example of those who would live ungodly thereafter, and if he rescued Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, <coughs> excuse me, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented from day to day with their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the righteous under unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, especially those who indulge in the flesh, in its corrupt desires and despise authority. In our study of Second Peter, after uh, the series of studies on the Christian graces, we looked at the importance in our last lesson of knowing and keeping the truths of God in our minds, of reminding ourselves. And Peter talked about reminding people who really already knew the word about these things because he's talking about if you keep the Christian graces, he said in verse 11, he said the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. And then he goes on in verse 12 by saying, Therefore I shall always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them, and have been established in the truth which is present with you. And I consider it right, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir, up your, stir you up by way of reminder. And then Peter then talks about the dependability of the scriptures, the dependability of God's truth. And... Uh, Peter and the other apostles, he said, were eyewitnesses of Jesus and his ministry and his miracles and the things that happened to him and while he was on this earth. And in 2 Peter 1, 16, he said, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were there. We saw what was going on. And he said, The Father testified from heaven that Jesus was his son on the mountain of transfiguration, and they were there to witness that also. Uh, notice he goes on to say, and when he received honor, when Jesus received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So he's saying you can depend on the scriptures uh, we were there. We saw what we're telling you about. And he goes on to say that the scriptures originated in heaven. They did not originate here on earth with mankind. They originated in heaven. In verse 20, he said, Know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy is ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Now, if these scriptures were not the private interpretation of the prophets who made them, then no man has the right to put his own private interpretation upon the scriptures. 
Uh, and because of this truth and for this reason, Peter began to talk about false teachers who were doing that very thing, who were putting their private interpretation upon the scriptures. And so the next section we'll look in the first three verses at the warning against false teachers in chapter 2, 1 through 3. Peter had just stated here that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. And then he said uh, it was not an act of human will in chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. And so then Peter begins to warn against false prophets who would originate their own prophecies or put their own private interpretations upon God's truth. He said false prophets will also arise among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them and bring swift destruction upon themselves. Before the fall of man into sin in the Garden of Eden, Satan tempted Eve through a serpent uh, in the garden. Now the reason he did that was because there was no person that he could use. But after the fall of man, there was always somebody available uh, for Satan to use as a tool to, to teach falsely or to tempt people to sin in some way or another. And so after that, he uses people, starting with Cain, of course, and on down to this very day. So what he's saying here is that first, uh, there were false teachers among God's people in the Old Testament. Now, ordinarily, we look at a verse that says if a prophet uh, teaches and then what he says doesn't come true, then you don't listen to that prophet. But I want you to listen to this one. This is a different one I'm going to in Deuteronomy 13, beginning in verse 1. He said, if a prophet or a dreamer arises among you and gives you a sign or wonder, and the sign or wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the word of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So he's saying, even if this false prophet rises up and he begins to teach something and he gives a sign and the sign comes true and everything looks really good, if he's leading you away from God or he's leading you away from God's word, he said, don't listen to him. He said, because God's testing you to see if you love him enough to go ahead and keep his word. He said, you shall follow the Lord your God and fear him and you shall keep his commandments and listen to his voice and serve him and cling to him. And he goes on to say, you can go ahead and put that prophet to death. Now, we don't do that, of course, in this age. That was in that age, and that was a different age. We, we're not allowed to do that anymore. Uh, but it's, it's an insight, I believe, into the fact that uh, we need to adhere to God's word, even if some guy's coming along performing uh, what uh, he thinks is a miracle, or what we may think is a miracle. And uh, there were some prophets who were simply deceived in their own minds in the Old Testament. In Jeremiah chapter 14 and verse 14, he said, Then the Lord said to me, The prophets are prophets sighing falsehood in my name. I have neither sent them nor commanded them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and the deception, notice this, and the deception of their own minds. They had, they had come to believe their own prophecies. They had deceived themselves so that they had come to believe their own prophecies. And so many false prophets do. Now they had many other motives, but we don't have time to go into all of that, and I want to just let Peter reveal what he will about that, concerning that. Uh, and so first he says there were... Uh, false prophets among God's people in the Old Testament. And then he goes on to say, in the New Testament era, it will be no different that there will be false prophets among the people of the New Testament church also. Uh, and there are many warnings. We just read the, the, the letters to the churches. There are just a number of warnings. And let me just read one of them to you. Paul warns the elders at Ephesus in the verses that you're very familiar with in Acts 20, 28. 
He said to be on guard for yourselves and all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has raised your overseers to shepherd the church of God, which is purchased with his own blood. And then he says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert and remember that day and night, for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish, admonish each of you with tears. And now I commend you to God, notice this, I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among those who are sanctified. Now the third thing he said about the false prophets here in verse 1 is that they will secretly introduce destructive heresies. The word secretly is translated from the Greek word parastego, and uh, it means to lead in aside or beside of, to bring in secretly or craftily. And so the idea is that the prophet would take that which was false and he would lead it in and lay it down beside the truth and kind of mix a little bit in until, you know, it became uh, mixed up. And then the idea is that you just layer a little more on and you layer a little more on and you layer a little more on the false stuff as time goes on. You don't just go out there and just say, uh, you know, just really speak out this false prophecy. You just kind of lay it on a little at the time until finally what he's teaching then, the people begin to accept it because it's just been gradual and they're giving it to him. And that's the idea. That's the way false teachers work. And what he's saying is that the destruction of these prophets may not come immediately, but when it does, it'll be swift uh, as we go back to our text. Now, false teachers will not only bring destruction to themselves, but they will bring destruction to those who follow their teaching. And he said some false teachers would follow, uh, uh, lead the people into sensuality in verse 2. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of the way, uh, because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. Sensuality is uh, translated from uh, the Greek word, asalgia. And Thayer translated, translates it as unbridled lust, excess, licentiousness, lasciviousness, outrageousness, shamelessness, insolence. Uh, in other words, going too far in uh, sinful ways. I'm just telling you this story quickly. Uh, a long time ago, uh, when I went to Australia on a campaign, the preacher that baptized me had gone to Australia with two other men, and uh, he was there, and uh, one of the men got discouraged and, come, discouraged and came back because uh, this one preacher was preaching licentious doctrine and leading the congregation away into doing sinful things that was just against the will of God. And so when we went over, and most of us didn't know about this situation, some of the leaders did, and what we did was, rather than, uh, well, let me just say this. All that was left was the preacher that had baptized me and one other family. The rest of this group had become unfaithful into licentious ways, into sensuality. And so we took, <coughs> excuse me, we took those two families and built a congregation. We baptized 45 people and built a congregation around them while we were there. But that's just to show that it does happen. And, and people who want to live like the world still go to heaven are easy targets for this. Whenever you really, I mean, to get out there, the religious wing of the homosexual movement follows such teachers as this. When you get to heaven but still want to do the ungodly things they do. And because of such teachers and their followers, he said the way of the truth will be maligned. In other words, people will take what people pass off as Christianity and say, well, this is worse than we live, and they'll just uh, condemn the whole of Christianity as a result of that. The truth will be maligned. And false teachers in their greed, or whatever they hope to gain in their teaching, will exploit people, he said, with false words in verse 3. In their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Uh, so some teachers will 
exploit people by changing uh, the gospel so that it fits the society. In other words, society is so different than it was whenever the gospel was given that they will accept this now. They won't really accept it if we just teach it like it was in the first century. So let's change it a little and make it acceptable to the people rather than making the people adhere to the gospel so they'll be acceptable to God. And so there's all kinds of different reasons for that. And he says, even though some of those teachers taught hundreds of years ago, God has not forgotten. It is not idle or asleep concerning their judgment and destruction. And so this brings us to the next part of our lesson, the destruction of false teachers. As proof that God would judge false teachers who rebel against him, Peter cites three instances uh, uh, from the past as proof of that. First of all, he said he did not spare the angels that sinned in verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. There's much spec speculation about the sins of these angels, but we need not go past what is written. Angels, first of all, let me just say, were created beings sent forth as messengers of God. In Hebrews 1, 4, it says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who inherit salvation? Uh, so they minister to Christians in this age. And they appear to be outside God's redemptive grace. In other words, Jesus didn't die for them. He died for mankind. In uh, the Hebrew letter in Hebrews 2.16, it says, For assuredly he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. That is, help for salvation is what it's talking about in that context. And uh, Jude indicates some angel sins by rebelling against the position for which God created them. Jude 6 says, The angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper mode, he abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness, for the judgment of the great day. So whatever it was that God created them for, they went off and said, we're going to do our own thing. And they did. And they then are kept under uh, judgment. As also Peter talks about here. Uh, this word hell here uh, is from the word... Tartar o -O, which is uh, really the only place it's ever used in the scriptures. It's used only here, but it is the equivalent of the idea of the Jewish Gehenna uh, of eternal fire. Here it's called uh, darkness. Uh, and so hell is a place of darkness and fire for those who refuse to follow God in his ways. So, first of all, he, he, he talks about the angels, and secondly, he said God destroyed the ancient world in Noah's day in the flood, as the second example he uses in verse 5. He said he did not spare the ancient world, but he preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood on the world of the ungodly. I'm not going to talk a lot about that because you know that so well. It's so well documented, even though liberal theologians and unbelievers refuse to believe there was a worldwide flood. But the reason for that flood is plainly brought out in scriptures. When you go back to Genesis 6 and verse 5, it said, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so by his lifestyle and the things that he did, he was teaching. He, the people were false teachers at that time. And uh, so by their very lifestyle and the things they told each other, and then the third is the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah mentioned in verses 6 and 7. He condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, <clears throat> having made them an example of those who would live ungodly thereafter. And he goes on to talk about how he rescued Lot, who was, <clears throat> he said, uh, tormented day after day by their lawless deeds uh, because he was righteous. 
The cities not only prove that God's judgment will destroy false teachers, and again, by their lifestyle, they were teaching others what to do, but he said those cities prove that God will uh, judge and destroy those who live ungodly lifestyles. Uh, again, the religious uh, segment of the homosexual movement uh, uh, really claims that this happened because these cities were just uh, had a lack of hospitality. They ignore the rest of the scriptures, and especially what Jude wrote in Jude 7. He said, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they were in the same way as those indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh and are exhibited as an example of undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. He said they stand out as an example of strange flesh, of homosexuality in other words. <clears throat> and then he goes on to talk about those teachers it would be under judgment, and he gives special uh, attention to those who indulge in the flesh and those who despise authority uh, in verse 9 and 10. So then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Now, I'm not going any further than that. The next lesson, if I do another lesson on this, I'll discuss this despising of authority. But that's as far as I'm going on this tonight. <clears throat> the third thing I want to talk about is God's rescue plan, to finish the lesson with this. <clears throat> In verse, uh, it's unfortunate, or rather, it, let me say, it's fortunate for mankind, as opposed to the angel, it was unfortunate for them, as opposed to the angel that sinned, that God has a rescue plan, a plan to redeem us when he didn't have the angels. In verse 9, it said, Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. He has a rescue plan. God did not spare the angels that were under punishment, according to verse 4. Uh, there were just awaiting judgment in the place uh, where God has put them to that time. However, God did preserve Noah and his family because they were righteous. And in fact, Noah was a preacher of righteousness, it says here, as opposed to the false teachers he's talking about in this section. He did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, that is his family, of course, whenever he brought a flood on the world of the ungodly. Then he talks about Lot. Lot made some bad choices. Uh, as a result of his bad choices, which we're not going to talk a lot about, he ended up with only saving two of his daughters. Remember Lot's wife? If you don't, go back and read it. <clears throat> so... He did remain righteous, and he did not accept the immoral lifestyles of those that were living around him. It says it troubled him. He, he was, uh, uh, how does it put it here? Uh, he saw he was righteous, and he said his soul was tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. And so he remained righteous among them. And, and let me just finish this by saying there is a big difference in living in a culture where there is evil and a culture that is evil. And he talks about cultures that are evil when he talks about the flood period and when he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. Those cultures had become extremely evil so that God had destroyed them. Now there is some evil and always has been in every culture since the fall of man. Uh, even in the church there is some evil in the culture of the church and it is a place where we are supposed to be following God and are righteous in fact uh, this is what he's talking about he said but the false prophets are among the people just as there will be false teachers among you you and the church is what he's, Peter is saying and uh, so in every society, in every organization, even the church, there is some evil. 
But there's a difference in there being some evil than there being a culture of evil. You know, moral decay is eating away at our society quickly. Uh, that is leading us into a cultural evil as we slouch our way towards Sodom. As, uh, to, just to show this is true, in the last election, three states, Maine, Maryland, and Washington, voted to legalize homosexual marriage. That means that more than half of the people, and I, I didn't look up to see what the statistics were on how many voted in, but at least more than half the people had to vote for it in order for it to happen. And they joined five other states, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Iowa, Vermont, New Hampshire, along with Washington, D.C., that had legalized it through legislation. It had happened through legislation before and have been for a while. This is the first time it's been voted in that more than half the people said, yes, we wanted it. And at the same time, Minnesota rejected a state constitutional amendment to define marriage as an opposite sex union. He said, no longer do we, no, we don't want to define it as, as a, a, you know, marriage as between a man and a woman. Now, that'll be the next state, of course, that will probably vote in homosexual marriage. They've already made a statement about that with their vote. So we are moving more and more in our culture, uh, not to a culture which has evil in it, but into a culture of evil. And as we move in that direction in our culture, I think it's time for us in the church to stop majoring in minors and take up the real work of the church, and that is saving souls. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul said, of which I am chief. And so we need to quit fussing about little things that we may fuss about or complain about and so forth and really get down to the work of the church, which is to save the souls of people, our own first and in our society. So God has a rescue plan for any and all who desire to live a righteous life, and we need to be telling people about it. And notice what he says. He uses the word F several times. He said, if God did not spare angels of sin, and if he did not spare the ancient world, that F is understood there, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and if he rescued Lot, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. And he did do those things. If he did them, and he did them, then he knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. He has a plan. We can only achieve righteousness through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is God's rescue plan. And the rest of that rescue plan is that we're to go into all the world and teach the gospel of the whole creation. In Romans 6, we're to be baptized into the death of Christ where he shed his blood. Verse 3 said, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. We've been united with him in the life of his death. We will be uh, like him and uh, be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, our body of sin might be done away, that we'd no longer be slaves to sin. You know, God's rescue plan is to rescue people who are slaves to sin. Now, God has a plan in place, but people have to want to be rescued from sin. And sometimes people fall in love with sin, and they don't want to be rescued. I like it where I am. But God has rescue plan, and we need to find those who want to be rescued and to begin to rescue. And if you haven't been rescued, if you haven't obeyed that gospel tonight and been rescued from hell, think of the people that's going to be there. The people from Sodom and Gomorrah. 
the people before the flood, that's who you'd have to spend eternity with if you go to heaven. You want to live in eternity with that kind of people? I don't. I want to spend eternity with righteous people. So if you haven't made that choice, now is the time when we stand and sing to encourage you.